Hey everybody, I recently made a video on the GLOW protocol, GHKCU, BPC157, and TB500. The purpose of this video is to review the available research and differentiate the effects of GLOW and CLO, which is the blend with an addition of KPV. I've covered all these peptides in detail and reviewed their preclinical and human research in other videos, which I'll make sure to link below. To save time and make things a bit easier, I'm going to attach what I said previously on the compounds of the GLO blend. If you saw my last video on GLO, stick around for the recap or jump ahead to the discussion on KPV, as well as its possible risks and benefits. Does this tripeptide actually add anything to the stack or does it complicate? It. As I've emphasized before, anecdote has its place, but the point here is to step back and look at the entire picture. If we're going to speculate on benefits from non-human data, we have to apply the same lens to risks. Maybe it's just me, but regardless, let's get into it. If you do like this video, make sure to hit that thumbs up and give us a subscribe. It's the best way to help your small time peptide buddy out. Appreciate it. So what we could do is analyze what we know mechanistically about BPC-157, TB500, and GHKCU alone to suppose what they do and how they'd act in tandem. Let's start with BPC-157, pentadeca peptide originally isolated from human gastric acid that's implicated in preclinical models with features of angiogenesis, which is creating novel sources of blood supply, gastrointestinal absorption, as well as significant recovery of GI fistulas, chemical injuries, musculoskeletal damages, and more. Very fascinating collection of preclinical data. TB500 is a fragment of the much more studied thymosin peptide called TB4, specifically amino acids 17 to 23. It's thought to have overlapping pro-survival features, anti-apoptosis, preventative towards programmed cell death, angiogenesis like with BPC-157, and a possible role in inflammation and infection with a controversial unclear involvement in cancer seen to be anti-cancerous as a possible development cue, as well as a hindrance to chemotherapies and may even be linked to different types of cancers. GHK is a tripeptide consisting of just three amino acids. It shows a strong affinity for copper and binds it forming the GHKCU or the GHK copper complex. It was initially isolated from human albumin by a scientist named Lauren Pickart, who noticed it enhanced formation of products involved in regeneration of the liver. And although the peptide was initially thought to operate predominantly through regulating copper metabolism, as more researchers and institutions got involved in its analysis, general opinion about what it's working on, the public perception, has changed. Now the primary idea behind why it does what it does is thought to be surrounding modulation of gene expression, as it's been found to either stimulate or suppress expression of many different genes. But although initially isolated during these albumin studies, it was additionally found in the plasma, urine, and saliva, and and was found to decline with age, supporting the idea that its age-related decrease coincides with the body's impairment in the ability to heal itself. And so Pickard pretty much ran with the research to evaluate its proposed regenerative and anti-inflammatory properties, and in research models it did seem to impact different components of skin-related aging, modulating activity of metalloproteinases and their inhibitors, stimulating breakdown and synthesis of collagen and glycosaminoglycans, shown to improve health and ability of fibroblasts to replicate, which were exposed to anti-cancer radiation therapy, and served as a chemotaxin to recruit cells to the site of injury. My take on the glow stack was that it's an intriguing blend with a catchy name that's definitely served people anecdotally, but on paper it's probably less flashy than advertised. Each of the three peptides, BPC-157, TB500, and GHK-CU have interesting mechanistic data, but no studies exist on them in combination, particularly with regards to TB500 and its grand extrapolation of data from TB4, and I've certainly talked with you all in the past about the inherent unreliability of the research on TB500 itself. The theoretical upside is a mix of skin, gut, and musculoskeletal repair, but the risks track alongside those same features. BPC-157's angiogenesis, similar mechanistic overlap with TB500, and add on the concerns with TB4 and its anti-apoptotic nature raise obvious cancer questions because tumors thrive on new blood supply and pro-survival signaling, which, in a way, these two peptides 
characterize. GHKCU stands out with its gene expression modulation, but its role in this blend hasn't been clarified in any particularly meaningful way. Some proposed synergy with wound and skin healing components, but it remains more of a theoretical cocktail, appealing on paper but sitting squarely in more of a speculative gray zone until actual human research appears. And I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but it's worth clarifying here. KPV is interesting. It's a tripeptide fragment of alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, or alpha MSH, that's drawing attention for possible synergy with BPC157 as well. It's composed of lysine, proline, and valine, hence its name KPV, and while related to the melanotan family, it doesn't act through melanocortin receptors, as we see with MT1, MT2, PT141. Instead, it shows anti-inflammatory activity by inhibiting NF-kappa-B and MAPK signaling, lowering cytokines TNF-alpha and IL-1-beta, which together are quite inflammatory. Much of the interest around KPV has centered on gut health, hence why you see it in BPC-157 blends. And one of the most promising pieces of data is that in inflamed intestinal tissue, the PEPT1 transporter becomes more active, and KPV can use this pathway essentially to get into epithelial and immune cells, thus proposing it as more of a direct target to gastrointestinal injured tissue. And in rodent colitis models, oral KPV lowered inflammatory cytokines, improved weight recovery, and changed structural markers of inflammation within the colon. But the GI data isn't the full story here. KPV has been studied for antimicrobial and wound healing effects, with findings that it can inhibit staph and candida growth, improve corneal healing, healing in rabbits, reduce mucositis from chemotherapy, and even support healing of MRSA wounds in rodents. More recent work has looked at its role in protecting skin cells exposed to airborne toxins, and once again, the same anti-inflammatory signature shows up, NF-kappa-B and MAPK inhibition, alongside less oxidative damage, better cell survival. And so together, this makes KPV look like a flexible anti-inflammatory and reparative fragment. The problem, as is no surprise, is that the evidence base is paper thin, almost entirely preclinical, so animal models, cell cultures, with no published human trials. That means the risks are just as speculative as the benefits. So in theory, anti-inflammatory and reparative activity is attractive, but when you start stacking it with other peptides that drive angiogenesis and survival pathways, the potential downsides can't be dismissed. It's easy to imagine situations where that biology could be pushed too far in the wrong direction, and thus you have to ask yourself with some of these more complex blends, is it a double-edged sword? Or is one edge sharper than the other? It's hard to tell at times. And at this point, available literature suggests that combining multiple injectable peptides introduces significant safety uncertainties. Immunogenicity remains the most pressing concern. Peptide sequence, chemical modifications, and formulation impurities all influence the risk of anti-drug, antibody, or ADA formation, not to mention the risk that comes with using experimental gray market peptides in and of itself. But in this scenario that this exists, which isn't 100% by any means, anti-drug antibodies can either blunt therapeutic effect or trigger hypersensitivity responses. So when multiple peptides are administered together, cross-reactivity or immune interference becomes more likely complicating tolerance and increasing the chance of unpredictable immune activation. I would imagine less so than people actually injecting impure product itself. But beyond immunogenicity, mechanistic overlap carries its own risks. We already discussed some of those, but there's also competition competition for receptors and transport pathways that may generate additive or even antagonistic outcomes. Although we already touched on some cancer concerns, concurrent angiogenic and anti-apoptotic signaling as well could drive aberrant tissue remodeling or fibrosis, sending physiology more strongly in the opposite direction than one would want. The shared anti-inflammatory activity across several peptides also raises concern for impaired host defense, heightening infection risk. That said, given the lack of research, even the most basic dose-finding trials, it's hard to really say, and this isn't something the preclinical data highlights too strongly. A big one here, and 
probably one of the most pertinent is formulation instability, driven by differences in solubility, charge, and degradation profiles, which can accelerate aggregation, reduce potency, and increase the chance of adverse immune reactions. And so typically people would say, you know what, follow regulatory guidance, but in this case it doesn't exist because we don't have potent replicated stability testing, rigorous quality control, which would of course be essential for any sort of safe clinical use. Regardless, I hope this video helped isolate some of the differences between GLOW and CLO, which both are quite interesting. I'd particularly be concerned about not only these adjacent effects and risks, but also the fact that when we have several peptides within a single blend, I can imagine that it would reduce potency as well. But why don't you share what you think in the comments below? And by the way, if you haven't already and you like evidence-based peptide content, as well as the more controversial occasional social commentary, please give us a like and subscribe. I would really appreciate it. It's the best way to help the channel out. If you're looking for other ways to support the channel, I do have a Patreon there. It's not the largest community by any means, but that's where a lot of my video requests come from. I share new research, give my thoughts on other topics as well, pre-release videos, and I mostly want it to be a platform for communication and just in general, whether you like on the channel or join the Patreon, the support means the world to me. So thank you for watching. I hope you have a great day and take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based, pull up a chair, let's get this straight, peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.